So um, just as a little bit of background, I've been with uh, SDSU for about 10 years now. Um, stationed out here the whole time, out here in, the, uh, in Rapid City. And in 2018, we opened a, uh, a research farm east of Sturgis. And so some of the work that I'm going to be talking about is, is based uh, at the farm there. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to say I'm really I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I really uh, admire this crowd and this, the coalition and the work that they do. And I also appreciate you all for coming out because I know there's a lot of choices. And so um, I'm happy that you're spending 30 minutes with me, actually a little bit less. Um, so the farm itself, you know, we have, we, we, we are, my bias is plants because I'm, I'm literally a fair weather fan. We get to uh, take weekends off and holidays off and polar vortexes off, whereas the, the cow folks don't get to do that. And so I like the plants. Um, but more and more, we're, we're integrating livestock into our farm. Um, but any given year, we'll have research on probably 10 to 15 different crops. And uh, I always like to say that we're, we, we take on a lot of off-the-wall projects and probably do a lot of stuff that fails more, more times than it, when it works. And I, and I think that's just useful. Um, that we can say, hey, uh, maybe don't don't try this practice, or <laughs> maybe this crop isn't going to work here, you know. And I think that's that's good information for farmers. Um, so this particular project, um, basically, what we're we're looking at is we're looking at these small grain systems, and coming off of what used to be the traditional wheat fallow system, um, so we're starting to intensify. We're starting to add more crops into that wheat backbone. Um, and now looking at livestock, of course, a lot of people in this area are, are ranchers first and farmers by necessity. And so we're looking at how do we integrate livestock into that grain system. And it, as it turns out, SDSU has, a, has another uh, research site. Actually, it's, just, it's mostly a summer grazing site for the cattle that ha are housed out at um, Cottonwood near Phillip. And so the system that we're kind of looking at is can we grow annual forages that are for these cows that are coming off of summer pasture? They need somewhere to go in that little kind of shoulder transition period, um, and then they either go back to the 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 station there at at Cottonwood or else they're cold and they go off to the market. Um, and so we're looking at okay, so in these periods in our rotations, can we add annual annual forages? that we can target that shoulder season for cows to come and graze, and then they go off to wherever they go, and then we go back to our wheat, for example, in this case. And so we, so that's kind of the background of what, where our, our thinking was at, this kind of stockpiling forage. Um, and so we're looking at different ways to do this, um, how, different management practices with the livestock, and what we settled on was this, it, it's kind of a, a, a mob grave system that we have. And basically we wanted to look at, so if we can grow an annual forage, two, two options we looked at. Our control was uh, this sorghum sedan. And so basically what we were doing in this case is we're gonna grow sorghum sedan, we're gonna cut it, bale it, and remove it. That's it, no cows, no nothing. So that's kind of our standard control. And then we have this cover crop mix that we're looking at and we said, okay, so let's look at two different grazing scenarios. One is a swath graze. So we go in, we, we swath it, and then we graze the swaths. Uh, and the second is just, let's just put the cows in the, in the cover crops, let them graze, um, and then, then move them off. And so each of these systems, um, we had, you can see here, this is a swath graze plot, and you can see this is our herd here. Um, in some of our other control areas. We also had another control where we just grew a cover crop and just let it die and then plant into it. So no cows, just cover crop, die, wheat. Um, and so, you know, we, we looked to, we wanted to do uh, a graze about an acre every three days. And so that worked out to about, with our system, I'll show some other graphs on this. Um, it was about 700 pounds of biomass that we wanted to graze per day. 
And so we were rotating them fairly regularly. Um, it, you know, an acre a day, it worked out to about 20, well, I don't remember. It was, ten, it was 12 to 20 uh, steers uh, at each time. Um, and so the second objective, so once they, they got off, so we wanted to see that aspect. And then when we go to plant spring wheat in the next spring, we're going to plant with no fertility at all. So we wanted to look at the fertility value of the livestock. And then also, are there these short-term benefits to, to grazing here? And so basically what we did is we set this up, and you can see, so this would be a series of plots. We'd set this up, graze it, and then plant wheat. And then we'd move to the next one, graze it, plant wheat. In the third year, we did the same thing. So we did this over a three-year period, but each year we're looking at first-year effects, if that makes sense. Any questions on how we, we set this up? Okay. So these are the cover crops. Uh, the first thing, so we, we targeted kind of a late June to early September growing season, meaning that we planted in late, late June, depending on weather, various other conditions. And then we would graze in early September, late August. So the, again, we're looking at small grass or, or cool season, short grass prairies. So they're dying off. They're ending their life cycle in, you know, July, August. And so we're looking for extra grass for these cows. And so this was the idea was we wanted to move them in there about that time period. And then graze. And you can see um, this is the cover crop species. Really, all this is is oats, peas, and sorghum sedan. There's a few other things, but um, they're not there. They're not in any uh, amount that would have any difference, I think. And so you see, we have a cool season, a warm season, and then a cool season broadleaf. And the idea was that the sorghum sedan is is a warm season, so it's going to probably shut off in the late summer, whereas the, the oats keep going. And you can kind of see given our different years, uh, 2020, 21, and 22. So 22, miserable. Um, but 21, you have this opposite effect, where this is the out effect here. 22, we had a better early season growing period, and the sorghum sedan out, outperformed the, the cover crop. But, you know, we're looking at, in, in these years, about a ton of production. And so, you know, we're looking at grazing, like I said, 22,000 pounds for every three days. Um, and so obviously 21 was a pretty dry year. So this is just some of the background on, on what our, our biomass production was. I'm not going to spend much more time on this. And then I, I was trying to figure out where to put this in the, in the presentation, but I guess I won't bury the lead. So these are our yields of spring wheat following the grazing. So again, this is no fertility, no nitrogen. Uh, there's herbicide, but there's no, no phosphorus or anything. And so the important things, let's see, how much time do I have? I don't know how far to go into this. Okay, so if you're not familiar with box plots, sometimes they're called box and whiskers plots. There's a, you can cram a ton of data into these types of plots. And so there's a couple things I want to point out. Um, so we have the swath graze, we have the cover crop graze, and then we have our control, which again is our sorghum sedan, ungrazed, and then our cover crop control, ungrazed. And so each of these little points here is a measurement that we took over this three-year period. So we have lots of measurements, and then what you see here is this box. So this would be the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, so you can kind of see the spread of the data. And then you have this is the median, this line, and this triangle is, is the mean. And so, and then these points are the extremes, right? So I always put these in here because I, I want to point out that none of this stuff, when we say, oh, you got five bushels more on your spring wheat. Uh, yeah, that's an average, but there's a lot of spread in these things. So I always want to point this out. And so a couple things to note. A, these are significant. So this one here is about four or five bushels greater than our control and our cover crop control. So that's, that's interesting, right? Um, we got about four or five bushels out of our wheat from grazing cattle. These two are statistically, they're the same. Um, and then one of the things that you see, if you look at the difference between the cover crop and the swath graze, you see this is a much bigger spread, you know, almost 200 
percent swing in that. So if you think about a cover crop graze versus a swath graze, why do you think this variability within the wheat yield might be different? Why might have such high variability? What's going on there? Or think of the dynamics of the cows. Yeah, yeah. So this is a really important part because we would watch them and, you know, it, it kind of depends on what your goal is with this. But if you put the swaths down, that's where they're going to stay, right in the swaths. And so it's easy to sample. It's great for a soil scientist. Um, and you have a very controlled manure distribution in that way. But when they're gov uh, just going out and they're eating what they can, you know, it's much more distributed. Um, and it's much more variable. You see these patches and these islands. And then you get these cows that'll just sit down and lay there for the whole day, you know? And, and so, um, so that was a, an, an interesting difference that we watched as we watched them move through these pastures. Fortunately, what we were doing, though, was very intense and we were moving them a lot. So they didn't have a lot of room to move, um, but we were moving them pretty frequently. Um, so I think that was... I'll, I'll, come back to that, but that was a really critical component is how did these cows move? If you're looking at it from a fertility perspective, you want to get that even grazing. But if you're looking at it from a, say, a cover perspective, definitely the cover crop graze, there's a lot more around there. Uh, there's a lot more cover on the ground after they leave. So different ways to look at it. Um, so the question, and this is where the story gets a little bit boring, is why, why do they have these yields? Why was the yield differences? And so this is some of the water profile that we have. I, only have the, I don't have the uh, cover crop grazed on here. But as you can see, there's three. this is the profile. So going from the sur soil surface all the way to about three feet, just over three feet uh, into the ground. And you can kind of see there's a little bit of trends here. Control, sorghum sedan is, has the most water in it. Here's the swath grazing, and then the ungrazed cover crop always has a little bit less soil moisture in there. Why do you think that is? Any guesses? Growing season, right? When we swath, we kill it, and then the other stuff keeps growing for maybe a week, maybe a month later. Um, and so it's continuously uh, putting on roots and taking up that soil water. And so... But the thing is, is if you go back to the yields, this green line, that's the one where the highest yield was. So that's probably not the issue. Um, what is this? Total carbon and organic matter. What would you expect? First year effects. Would you expect to see anything from carbon? Any dynamic changes? Not really. If you look at these, so this is the cover crop control. The swath graze is the purple one. We can look at those kind of. And you can see the numbers are kind of all over the board. They're varying because we're moving down the field each year. But there's no, there's no real differences there. This is total carbon here in percentage. I don't know if you can see that y-axis very well. Um, but these are the different years. And so this is the same except this is organic matter. So we're 4.5%, we're pretty good organic matter overall. But you can see things kind of switch places. There's nothing really there that we can detect. Phosphorus and nitrogen. So, uh, you know, initially we kind of thought, well, there's a lot of manure. There's a lot of phosphorus in, in manure. Um, but again, you see these ragged things. They're all over the board. Total nitrogen, wouldn't expect that. Why, would you, why do you think, though, that the phosphorus didn't really move? Any guesses? So part of that is that the form that phosphorus is going down into the soil, it's organic, right? Um, and it, for a plant to use it, it's got to be converted. So A, phosphorus change is just slow in general, biologically. But B, the phosphate molecule itself is structured in such a way that it binds so tightly to the soil in general. And so once phosphorus hits the ground, um, it generally binds pretty tightly, and so you have to really overload the system sometimes if you want to see a quick change in phosphorus. Uh, total nitrogen, again, this is, this is organic, and so, you know, if you think back on what plants need, they need inorganic, and if you looked at this, let's say 2,000, 2,500 parts per million total nitrogen, what would you expect would be inorganic? What percentage? 
that the crops, the plants would, would be able to use of that. 50, 70. No, it's more like two or three or five percent of that total. And so again, you're not gonna see these changes in a short term system. Um, so kind of what we expected. Now, here's the fun part. This is the, that inorganic fraction. Um, and so this is nitrate, uh, which is one of the, probably the most uh, abundant nitrogen uh, ion in the soil. And so you can see these are the different soil profiles. So this is 0 to 3 inches, 3 to 6 inches, 6 to 12, and then 12 to 24. Swath grazing, cover crop graze, control, cover crop control. And so this is where we actually start to see some differences. This is in pounds per acre. Um, and again, if you start to add these up, usually we'll do a 0 to 24 to look at our soil nitrate. But big difference in the, in the top profile, quite a bit more nitrogen in our swath grays and in our cover crop grays, uh, and then quite a bit lower in our sorghum sedan. Bit more in the 3 to 6, and then here's where it evens out. So it's really the nitrogen that's concentrated in the top half of a foot that is, uh, seems to be driving a lot of this, this short-term change. This is ammonium. Uh, this is the other form of nitrogen available to plants. And really no differences here. They're all, they look like they kind of move around a little bit, um, but not much change there. And then one of the reasons why I think this is probably uh, we're onto something here, and why this may be the real driver of this system is when we look at our flag leaf nitrogen. So look at our flag leaf, that's that end thesis. And so that's the, the leaf that is right below the head in the, in the wheat plant. And we're looking at the nitrogen content in that. And what do you see here? So this is grain yield on the y-axis and nitrogen percent in the flag leaf. So this kind of relationship, what is this, when you see this, what does it tell you? It's positive, so it's increasing. As one increases, the other seems to increase. Um, but you also see these points out here. So again, these are individual measurements. And so it's not super tight around that, that line, um, which is what this value tells you. That's from zero to one. And so there's a good a statistically significant relationship, but it's not it's not great, um, but there's something there. But then I look at the individual treatments and we get these weird effects. And so some of these things, like I say, they look nice if you go back here and it looks like, oh yeah, so if I have say 4% in my flag leaf, I'm doing pretty good, right? I got, I got probably pretty adequate nitrogen in there for, for maximized yield in this system. Um, but you get these weird things when you start looking out. So if I looked at this by treatment, you can see, for whatever reason, I don't know the reason on this, why the swath grays, no relationship there. But everything else seems to have this fairly good relationship, and it's just this one that's killing it. Um, so the point, though, is that a flag leaf can be an indicator of, of some fertility. You can, it's, it's kind of backcasting. There's nothing you can do about it at in thesis that you're going to improve the yield, but you can kind of say, hey, in my system where I had these cows, what does my flag leaf look like? Is it showing, am I showing issues of chlorosis or, you know, maybe the, it, it's, it's looking pretty good. Um, I still can't see the time. What do we have for time? Eight minutes. Perfect. Um, I'm going to go really quickly in some of these. So some of the microbial indicators, these are some of the things that we weren't sure about. And we say, want to say, well, are we going to see these different effects? And so this is respiration, average CO2 respiration. So what is respiration? What's, what's happening? We're measuring CO2, but why are we measuring CO2? Same process that we use, same process that trees use. It's respiration, which means we're metabolizing carbon. We're getting active. So the more CO2 we get, the more microbes we have. That's the theory, anyway. Um, what do we see? Everything in the control. So, you know, we start to see some decrease, big in 23, I only have two years on here, big change in 23, less change in 22. Um, and you have the swath graze, which was great in one year, not so great in the other. 
So kind of, I don't know what you do with those. Um, pox carbon. So this is another one that is basically, um, Jerry Hatfield was talking about the sugars in the soil. So this could be analogous to that. Uh, th that's the carbon that's readily available. So again, um, we should see some differences in this. And one year we saw in our swath grays some increase. Next year, no, it's all the same. So, um, sorry, this is over three years. Total fungi, no trends here, no trends here in the zero to three or to the three to six inch. The only thing you can see here is that when you cut it down into th small slices, a lot more of the activity is in zero to three as it into three to six. And remember, we're only talking about six inches. And so it gets worse as you go down. And so really it shows how important that top layer is for microbial activity. Uh, total bacteria, nothing there. Uh, mycorrhiza. Why are mycorrhiza important? Anyone know? Anyone a mycorrhiza fan? So, yeah, so one of the big things that they do is they're able to solubilize that, that phosphate that I talked about. They can excrete an enzyme that basically cuts those links that the soil, that the phosphate binds to the car or the soil. It cuts those links and all of a sudden that phosphorus is available. So we like, we like a uh, mycorrhiza. They're pretty cool. Um, but no changes here. No changes in the three to six. And then the fungi to bacteria ratio. Anyone have a guess as to why that would matter? It's kind of speculative. Five minutes? Okay. We want a good balance. I, in, in, I'll be honest, science doesn't know what that good balance is. It's all kind of shooting in the dark. But somehow, we don't. these fungi and bacteria are doing different roles. They're playing different roles in the soil. And so the, somehow we need to sort of balance those because when we get really... Uh, sometimes we get really fertilizer-heavy soils. Sometimes we get really tillage-heavy soils. You start to see this balance shift to bacteria. And then certain functions we start to lose So in, in the fungi. As I said, they're doing things like making nutrients available. Um, the bacteria, of course, they're more rapid turnovers. So they're making short-term gains, whereas the fungi are more the marathoners. Um, and so looking at that balance. Here, no... no uh, no statistically significant results. So these are fun papers to write when you just say over and over. No, not statistical. Um, so I'll close up right here. I'd love to get some more discussion if we had any time. But really, building soil carbon is a, and, and soil health is, is a marathon, not a sprint. And so you hear that over and over, especially when we focus on carbon, carbon, carbon. Carbon is the long man's game. And so... Uh, what we wanted to do is set out in this and say, you know what, that's true. That's definitely, we show that in the data, but maybe there's some short-term benefits as well. And so we saw that in our spring wheat yields. Um, and that was really the big thrust of this, this research. Um, I think there's a lot of value in debating standing cover crop versus swathing when you graze. Anyone have any opinions on that? Obviously, when you don't have to swath, that's one less pass you have to take. That's one less piece of equipment you have to have. Yeah? It depends on how close you are to a killing frost. Yeah. If you swath uh, before it freezes, you lock in the nutrient value. If you leave that outstanding and you're grazing in November, the value is really good. Absolutely. Yeah, so you, you have control over, or some control over the value of that forage more so than you would if you just turned the cows out. Um, so yeah, so that's a huge benefit. And you get this, as I was talking about before, again, this is after the cows have come in. This is what it was over here. This is them after that. And so you have some control over where specifically they're grazing as opposed to when you just turn it out. Um, grazing intensity is critical. You know, there's no magic number that we have. It was kind of uh, based on some of our animal scientists back of the envelope calculations. Um, we, we settle on about an acre every three days, you know, but we're managing 10 or 20 cows. Uh, a whole herd, how are you gonna do that? I think is debatable. Any, any thoughts on that? I think a three-day rotation is, is not a bad for workflow, you know, um, but some people do it much more intensively. Some people turn them out for the whole season and don't come back. 
anyway, I think there's there's a lot of value in, in thinking about those things and how they can work into these systems. Um, don't expect to see carbon changes next year. Um, it's just, I think in most cases where we do see carbon changes, it's not impossible, um, but I think a lot of it is an artifact of how we sample the soils. And so uh, that's really critical because we do see, well, that's why I want to show you those boxes, is there's a huge spread in the data. So when we give you a number, yes, it's a number, but it's an average of a lot of other numbers. And so there's a lot of variability out there in those fields. Um, and where we're going next is doing more of the virtual fencing. Um, always thinking about the workload, and I, I think this has a lot of benefits. Um, and so we have a big push for, for these types of um, more remote uh, processes and, and also some of the mixed species livestock. So next year we'll have some sheep in there with our cows um, and, and continue in this work. So I'll go ahead and... and Stop there. Um, thanks again, everyone. <laughs>